I'm Marlo DK from playbasenow.com and I have the privilege and honor to be here on stage. Oh God, I'm on stage. We are. I'm stage. not on stage with the magnificent Neil Jason, an all-time New York studio ace. He's been playing with everybody from Breaker Bros to uh, Dave Sanborn to uh, Roxy Music uh, to Dire Straits Very and good. you always up on uh, uh, Letterman show too. Yeah, I just did uh, last month I was on for a few weeks. But Neil's here with us today and incidentally, you know why I have this red signature base? Because of Mr. Jason. Because when I saw Neil Jason in Montmartre in Copenhagen 35 years ago, Sorry. That's okay. Okay, you, your man. I'm very I'm happy. Man. <laughs> uh, and so Neil, which was my first big, big base idol, I painted my base red. I went up to the attic and removed all the paint from my beautiful sunburst jazz base and painted red because of it. And I appreciate it. <laughs> okay, Neil, we're going to talk a little bit about your your equipment. What do you use nowadays? Do you still have the red jazz base? I still have my red 65 L series, 1965. L series red jazz bass, almost no paint left on the body, but the headstock is still red. It's still red. Um, and I have a clone that was made by 30th Street Guitars in New York. That's a copy of that. And I have a few other 64s. And uh, now uh, for tours, I had a brand new Sadowski. Roger Sadowski just made this uh, brand new uh, Sadowski New York model for my tour. And of course it's red. And um, we're working on the neck, and as soon as we finish the neck perfectly, the headstock will be made red. Uh, I, I've seen that all the, the studio players of New York, they have this uh, uh, ongoing thing with Roger Sadowski. What does make the bases so great in your well, opinion? Well, uh, I met Roger about 35 years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, he made me my first fretless that I fell in love with. And he was an acoustic guitar maker who slowly became an electric guitar maker and his care of the way the instrument is made and the value that he puts into an instrument they feel fantastic and they sound fantastic and it's a great alternative to an old Fender because it's a new modern sound but it feels like a perfect vintage instrument and uh, they they always sound good and it's hard to find an old one anymore that sounds good and I can't tour with a 64 or a 65 it's too dangerous mm -hmm. um, and these are built to take it on the road so I was thrilled that he put this together for me and it's just fantastic what kind of strings do you uh, put on it? Um, uh, I use now I use uh, the Dario uh, mm -hmm. 45 65 80 105 I don't use 85s I, I use 80 I'm used to it from the old days so that's the this string combination that forms a really perfect curve for me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, the Dario is kind enough to make a custom set for me, mm -hmm. 45, 65, 80, 105. I use it on all my bases and they sound fantastic and they last. I mean, I beat the crap out of these for the last week and uh, these have been on for three days and they still sound fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, and my amp of choice now uh, is Mark Bass. Yeah. And uh, I uh, sponsor Mark Bass and I use a lot of their uh, gear. I love to use that. And I have uh, a pedal board, which I just put together for this tour. This um, chorus pedal, the Ibanez C9, is the original C9 chorus pedal that I've been using since the day I've been started playing. <laughs> and yeah. it's still my favorite, and so it's on the pedal board. Uh, Mark Bass gave me a wonderful um, distortion box. This is my original OC2 octave divider. Mm, that's great, yeah. And this is my original DOD. I used to use a Seamoon Funk machine, but that doesn't exist anymore. And this envelope filter is the closest thing that I've come across. I also go wireless almost all the time with a Line 6 digital wireless. And I don't plug into the wall anymore. I use this uh, uh, Eneloop by Sanyo which powers all of these boxes mm -hmm. just by turning it on everything is powered battery powered not plugged into the wall and i keep a spare on the board that's charging right now in case anything goes wrong i just pop this out pop it into this one and i have power 
for yeah. all my pedals. Speaking of uh, the wireless, you always had a pretty energetic uh, presence on stage. So yeah, the wireless still helps. Jump on. <laughs> Not as much as I used to, but I like to be able to move around and the wireless affords me the possibility of being able to get away from the amp and go visit with the drummer while we're playing wow, we're without playing. tripping over the wires. And uh, this digital system is fantastic. There's very, very minimal change in the sound. I almost can't tell the difference. And uh, very enjoyable to be able to just wander around. It. I remember your signature sound was use of the chorus pedal. Yeah. That's very much part of the, part of the Jason sound. That's the Are one. you still using it? A lot. I use it in a lot of songs and I turn it on and off and again I have every one that's ever been made that one works on bass I don't know why it always did and I still love that sound so I have four of them oh. um, of the old ones, the old I, ones okay. yeah I bought them whenever I could find them and but that's my actual original one that I still love and I carry it and I have spares at home and it's a certain sound. It, this is the exact one I used on Dave Sanborn's record. Uh, yeah, I just heard Hideaway today. The, this the is the one that's on Hideaway. That, that, that's, that's the pedal. Let's visit the pedal again. <laughs> David Sanborn, Hideaway, Neil Jason on bass. Uh, listen to it, you have this signature way of playing where you use a lot of, you pluck the lower strings a lot when you slap. Yeah. You use a lot of simultaneous octaves yeah. and a lot of gliss. Doo, yeah. doo. That's really your Neil Jason. And well, that was some of my my first, uh, as you were one of my first influences, I used well, that I a lot on my, yeah. my first first records. I get very excited. <laughs> go home with the neck. But you don't have the jumpsuit anymore. No, I don't wear the overalls anymore. The overalls, um, yeah. And my friends want to know where the overalls are, and my wife is very happy that I can't find them. <laughs> as my friends, so when I meet people from the 80s, they always ask me, where's all your hair? <laughs> I left it in the 80s. Yes, so, so did I. Should and uh, I decided on this new color that I love, this white color. Now, <laughs> it's so. very, goes well with the black, <laughs> right, the black attire. Well. And actually, you're interviewing me on my birthday. Yes, I was coming to that, and I forgot when we started into you to say happy birthday to Neil Jason. Thank you so much. Uh, and we, I have a small present for you later. Maybe you don't want it. It's like a pair of socks, but uh, it's. Hey, <laughs> I'm on tour. Socks it's are good. It's like a pair of socks. Okay, it's like a pair. Okay, we'll keep that. <laughs> for to you will be a light of okay. okay. with a, a, another gauge. Okay, we'll keep that okay. between us. We're going to do East River tonight, yeah. You wrote that, didn't you? Yes, I wrote it with a friend of mine like 40 years ago. The, the keyboard player from that time? Or what? Uh, no, it was uh, a drummer in a band that I was working with at the time. Oh, okay, okay. And uh, yeah, the song, uh, we did it in the studio and it came out fantastic and it's been a staple with the Breckers for 35 years mm -hmm. now. And it was a big top 40 hit in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, I still love playing it. We play it on the Letterman show all the time whenever I'm on. Paul yeah, Schaefer calls great, it as a song. It's a great song. Maybe okay. some of you will remember I did a play along of uh, East River. And I watched it on YouTube. <laughs> it was very good. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> I didn't tell him. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move into something about practicing. I know you were uh, a uh, uh, player your caliber working in the New York scene. You need to be able to play all kinds of music. What did you do when you landed, for instance, the gig with Gregor Brothers? From uh, how, how did you approach, and in, in general, how do you pro approach practicing? What did you practice? What should you practice? Well, practicing is different than playing and performing, and playing in the studio is different than playing on the road. Um, 
I practiced, there, there's two w different things to practice. One is practicing your sight reading and playing along with people that are better than you so you can learn their styles. Listening, very, very important to listen to many, like listen to Latin, listen to French music, listen to Moroccan music, now listen to hip hop, listen to rock. Because it, whether you play that style or not, incorporating those thoughts in your playing is very important. And on a session, you don't know what they're going to hand you. So you might go into a session and even if you're playing in a rock thing, it, it might have a Latin influence to it. And if you've listened to enough really good Latin players, you could draw on that. Um, the other part about practicing is muscle control. The amount of time that you spend building your chops as the muscles. It's like working out. Um, a baseball player doesn't just play baseball. He does push-ups, he does sit-ups, he runs on the track, he does jumping jacks. They don't do that when they're playing baseball, but you do it to strengthen your muscles. I do that kind of stuff on the bass. Sometimes I'll just play with this hand and I'll do 16th notes between two strings, between three strings, between four strings for an hour. Just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Could you do that for an hour without getting bored? How did you... <laughs> no. <laughs> How um, can you do that? What I'll do is uh, sometimes I'll pick a period of time, like uh, four minutes, and Maybe I'll do a scale with double notes for four minutes, don't stop. It doesn't have to be a fast tempo, it doesn't have to be a slow tempo, but you don't stop. Even as you feel this getting tight mm -hmm. and you feel yourself falling, you keep going, then you stop. You wait a minute, wait for the swelling to go down, then you do it again, then you stop. It's, think about how somebody in a gym works out. You do. 10 and then you rest then you do 10 and then you rest. and when you do that it builds up the the muscles and the stamina for the playing the stamina yeah. for playing um, in the studio the perfection of being able to control your muscles is very important on stage the stamina is the most important thing because i play probably four times harder on stage yeah. than when I practice. When yeah. you practice, you know, you can relax a little bit, but you concentrate. When you're on stage, there's no, you can't think. You have to just play, and you play very hard. Standing next to Terry Bozio, you have to be on your toes. Standing next to any of the, to Anton Fig, Steve Jordan, Steve Gadd, Rick Murata, they play with passion, and they play hard. And you do too, you have to do it too. And I watched a lot of my idols play, you know, bass players that I respected like Will Lee and Bob Babbitt and Jocko and I saw them up close and I spoke to them and I started to understand the dedication and the concentration that it takes to get to that level. And yeah, there was a 10 year period where I probably practiced seven hours a day, anything. Play any, play a saxophone book, play a guitar book, play a bass book, play what's in your mind. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to play along with Stevie Wonder records when he would play with his left hand and I would try and imitate it on the, because it's nearly impossible to play because a keyboard player could do this. Not so easy on the bass. But if you start to do that, it gives you other ideas and it, it broadens your ideas of what it is to have chops. Speed is one thing, but Technique and heart is very important. Soul music, um, which I love a lot, I, I used to listen to James Brown records and Bootsy would play two notes for like 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. It's the best two notes I ever heard. On the one. <laughs> right, or the one note. And then I would see John McLaughlin's band and Stanley Clark and guys, and every a million notes a minute. And uh, fortunately, I got to play with these people. I got to play with John McLaughlin. and I got to play with a lot of the funk bands. And you learn when to go and when to shut up and sit down and play, stay on the bottom, because you are the bass. And somebody has to set it up. You and the drummer 
That's the engine. Somebody else is soloing, you don't try to overpower them. You try and give them a foundation. And that's what I love about the bass. Mm -hmm. The thickness of the foundation, the, the love of playing with the drummer correctly. And then every once in a while you get that. <laughs> and you go back and you be a good boy. And, you know. and that's what the pedals are for, is every once in a while, it, you hear a sound in your head mm -hmm. and you just want to expand on it. You hit a pedal and it's like, oh, and for 16 bars, you could do something different. When you go back, it's you feel like you settled the band and the band feels it too. And very important things to remember when you're practicing. It's not about you. It's about the song. It's about the band. It's not just about, I can play this. No, it's, if I play this, does it make the song better? So all those years of practicing and building up your muscles is so that you can control your thoughts and your passion and center it correctly. And that's what makes me very happy when I play. Even now, 40 years later, playing with Randy and playing with Terry, and it's, I feel it come back right away. And it makes me very, it makes me feel young again. <laughs> We are always young when you play music. There's no age limit. In no, that there sense. isn't actually. That's a beautiful thing about. That's uh, what I love about playing. Music. And um, now uh, with my wife's band, my wife has a big band. Her name is Brigitte Zari. I just produced her new album, and again, it's the joy of like hearing new songs played with a big band and just playing things that you don't play every day, and it makes you love music even more. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, just a quick story. I was walking around yesterday in where were we? Switzerland. In, uh, Wasn't that? I was in Switzerland. Okay. We, oh yes, we were in Switzerland <laughs> yesterday, and I I took a walk out in a field. Um, it was a big cornfield, and I went for a walk, and I thought I heard music somewhere, and then the music stopped, and I couldn't find it. Then it started again, and it sounded like longhorns, like ooh, boo, 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 boo. and then I heard a mistake. I said, wait a minute, it can't be a record. Who has a record that has mistakes on it? I walk around the corner of the cornfield, and I have it on video. Three gentlemen, old gentlemen, with their longhorns, mm -hmm. practicing in an open barn. Unbelievable. I watched them for a half an hour, and it gave me so much energy to see these men who, they're not going to play tomorrow for money. They're not doing it because people are coming to a stadium. They're doing it because they love the music. And it made me feel good. And I went back and I shared the video with the band and we all looked at each other and went, that's it. These guys look so happy and it made me happy. That's music, that's what it's for. That is why we play. And remember that and practice seven hours a day. <laughs> Well, at least for we'll a couple of years. Yeah. Again, Neil Jason, thank you so much for bringing this to the viewers of PlayBaseNow.com. My pleasure. Can you say you're watching PlayBaseNow.com? You're watching PlayBaseNow.com.